What's up guys and welcome back to Job Site Conditions right here on Deco Creek TV. My name's Jeff and on today's episode we're going to be showing you guys how to transform an 80 year old concrete floor into a functional living space. Now this is going to be a step-by-step -step video with all the tools and equipment that you're going to need so stay tuned because you're going to learn all about it. So today's project is gonna rate as a four on our DIY meter, and the main products we're gonna be using is 100 epoxy and rock hard urethane, both from Deco Creep. Now these products will create a long lasting, highly durable, low maintenance floor, all with a low odor, easy to use system, perfect for contractors or DIYers. The epoxy and the broadcast media are both available in a wide variety of colors to fit any situation. Well, there's really a ton of tools that might come in handy on an epoxy job, and honestly, we could probably fill up an entire video if we we're gonna cover them all. But at bare minimum, we're gonna need a drill and a mixing paddle, a few paint sticks, a few different application squeegees, uh, some roller covers and frames, a paintbrush, some spike shoes, and a box of gloves. Now we'll cover all the equipment and moisture testing once we get out to the job site. And don't worry, these tools and products are all linked right down in the description below. So before we get started doing any of the prep work for this project, I just wanted to take a minute and go over all the equipment that we're gonna need. So uh, one of the first things is obviously gonna be this grinder. You know, it's just really important that we, this is really what makes this epoxy system work is being able to grind the floor. Again, we're removing paint, we're opening up the pores, all the stuff we need to do to make that epoxy function. Uh, being in, in a basement and uh, there, there's no walkout access to the outside, man, this little eight inch uh, from Ditec here really comes in nice and handy because we can just bring this thing right down the steps and still be able to, to be pretty efficient at the grinding. Now, uh, this guy over here, our uh, vacuum, again, another thing that's just so crucial to these jobs is actually having a high-end dust vac that's made for doing what we're doing. Uh, if I came down here and just tried to use my, you know, even a, a decent two or $300 shop vac, um, I'm telling you, it's only gonna last me about five to 10 minutes, even with that fine particle bag. This, this dust is so fine and so abrasive that it's just gonna wanna blow out the sides. Um, you know, again, in, in probably under 10 minutes. So I definitely need something that's got um, some sort of a way to actually clean the filters so I don't have to worry about dust blowing out the sides. I like this one uh, from Paul's Pack because it does that automatically for you. When you turn this thing on, um, you know, every 30 seconds to a minute somewhere in there, you'll hear it make a weird noise and that's the solenoids pulsing against them filters and, and keeping them clean. So very, very important uh, that we have obviously the grinder to do what we need to do for the prep, but then also something to collect our dust. We're also, even though we have this guy down here and this is making things go really fast for us, uh, we are gonna need some sort of a hand grinder for a few different reasons. I like this one here from Makita because it has a variable speed dial on it, so I can you know, turn it up to a normal you know, four inch angle grinder or I can slow it down uh, if I need to. Uh, we're gonna need something like this, uh, some sort of a shroud. Again, we gotta catch all that dust. Even a little guy like this, if you start grinding on a concrete floor, there's gonna be dust everywhere really, really fast. Uh, so this is made, but it'll attach right on that grinder, hook right up to my shop vac, and I'm good to go. Now, the other thing that I'm gonna need this hand grinder for is to actually chase the cracks. Um, you know, there is a few cracks in this floor and we're gonna need to open those up so we can get our quick fix in there. And we're gonna need some sort of a crack chase wheel just like this one to do that. It, as far as the quick fix goes, uh, obviously we're gonna need a couple odds and ends like some mixing containers and some things like that. But the biggest thing we're gonna need is an actual trowel uh, to smooth out our quick fix. So I think that's about it for, for hand tools, grinders, vacuums, things like that. One last thing we need to, to address though, um, again, it's, it's just so important for any of these non-breathable coatings that we don't um, you know, trap any moisture in the floor. And so you know, always we're gonna have this, this moisture meter for, uh, with us so we can test our slab. We've already tested this one, everything is good to go. Um, but again, this just make sure that you bring this with you so you can do that test right away. So as you can see, uh, th this room is already well underway. The walls are painted, the, the ceiling's finished off. So we're gonna get to grinding and see what the concrete looks like. With an old floor like this, paint all over it, you never know exactly what you're gonna get into. So to start things off, you know, we just hit uh, two spots real quick, just do some tests. Again, you know, we got different diamonds, there's different ways of going about this. And we're just, uh, the best thing to do is just, just uh, take a second and get a good plan for what's working the best 
for the grinding part goes. Now, uh, again, being that there's paint on the floor, um, normally always uh, try these coating strippers out because this is a great way to remove paint or coatings. Um, and, and again, they, they, these weaves worked really good, just like we thought they would. But as a second test, uh, we went ahead and uh, tried to go with some arrow segments here. And so these are 16 grit arrows. And the cool thing about these arrows is when you're removing uh, paint like this, is it all tends to hang back in this little arrow part here instead of just staying up there on the surface of your diamond and it just doesn't glaze things over as bad. Now, um, the, you know, the, the beauty of doing uh, chips on a floor like this is that we don't have to really worry about what it looks like in the end. And so even though these arrows, I mean, it, it's gouging into it pretty good, that's okay. Um, that's actually perfect. A little bit more profile, it's actually gonna help our epoxy bond better. Um, again, these were working really well, although being a more expensive tool and a tool that wears down a little bit faster, um, you know, if these are working fine, um, we're just gonna stick with the arrows. So for this first step, the prep part of the job, well, we're gonna attack it for several different reasons. Now again, we're dealing with an older floor here that's got paint all over it. So this situation is just a little bit different than normal. Now, if this were a newer floor, I mean, we'd still be using this grinder, uh, but we wouldn't be trying to remove any paint. So what we'd be trying to do in that case is get rid of that really slick trial layer. Now we don't want that layer because those pores up there, they are just, they're just not open enough and we need to get down to a part of the slab where those pores are opened up so that that epoxy can really soak down in and grab on long term. Now, in this case, you know, again, it's a little bit different. This floor is so old that, you know, if there were no paint on it, we'd still be grinding it. Um, but now the main purpose is just to remove all this paint. Now, it doesn't matter what the situation is, we're still gonna use a diamond grinder and there are tons of different machines out there. Uh, but this little guy here from Ditech is just our go-to. If you've never run a machine like this before, um, it can take you by surprise. So I just want to talk about this real quick. And, and again, this is only an eight inch machine there, but with all those diamonds all turning the same direction, when I turn this guy on, it's going to want to pull a little bit on me. So I need to be ready for that um, once I actually turn this switch on. And so I always just recommend that you just, you know, go somewhere where, you know, where you're not going to mess anything up. Uh, don't go right in the middle of the floor um, and just, you know, start this guy up and just kind of get comfortable with it and make sure that, that you know what's happening um, before you take off with this thing. As far as, as the motion that we want to use, um, I tend to, to like to use just a back and forth, kind of like a windshield wiper uh, motion. And I like to start in the corner and I like to work my way back out of it. Now, preferences are different there. Um, if it's working for you, better to uh, start where you're at and move forward. By all means, there's no right or wrongs there. Again, the whole point of what we're doing right now is just to open them pores up. We don't really care what it looks like. So all I'm gonna do, I'm gonna turn this guy on and I'm gonna use that windshield wiper motion. I'm gonna work my way out of the corner and I'm just gonna keep moving. I would rather go back over a spot two or three times um, and to get all this paint removed rather than to just sit in one spot for a long period of time because it's going to end up making a low spot there. So we're about halfway uh, through grinding here. And, and again, the, um, the, the arrow setup is just working great as far as removing the paint, um, giving us the perfect uh, profile on the concrete. Um, now, again, you know, if this was, was a newer floor, you know, we already talked about this would be a lot different. We'd be removing surface um, uh, paste rather than, than paint. Uh, but if you look here, you can see that uh, we not only have a nice little profile on the concrete, so that's a good thing because that's going to give us some actual mechanical fingers to grab onto. But you can see that we can also, uh, we see a lot of sand and we see a lot of aggregate. So we know we're into the aggregate layer and, and that's what we're looking for is those really open pores and we want to see sand everywhere. If this is a brand new floor and uh, we'd still see some shiny spots somewhere or we'd see a spot where there isn't any sand, that's all got to come down. Now, I also wanted to stop for just a second and just point out a few of the interesting things that we've discovered um, as we're getting through this paint. We actually have what appears to be two different slabs of concrete. Again, we couldn't see any of this stuff in, in before, but it, it looks like this, you know, these uh, strips right here, it's like this got replaced and so we have two different slabs. Again, it's all gonna be fine. The chips are gonna cover all that up. Um, we didn't think that there was originally, you know, any cracks in here, uh, but now we notice that there is. Again, here's a, a crack that we just uncovered that we had no idea was there. We'll get some quick fix in there, patch all that up, as well as these uh, spalted areas, we'll be able to fix those up with some quick fix once we're done. We also found this spot here uh, that it looks like it had um, been through some sort of repair. And honestly, it doesn't, uh, doesn't sound the greatest in there, but uh, we ran the grinder over it. Everything seems to be nice and solid and uh, we'll you know, feather this in, we'll remove the rest of that paint, feather that in with quick fix. And again, these are all those things that you just don't know until you start uncovering stuff. 
But by the time we're said and done, it's all gonna look like one piece of concrete. So now that we're done with all the main grinding, um, you know, we just gotta address this edge right here. And you know, you guys can see that, that that big grinder, you know, it gets close, but we still have that little bit left to go. And obviously we gotta get rid of that paint in this situation, but even on a normal floor where there wasn't any paint, you still need to get rid of that paste layer, you know, all the way up to the wall as close as you can get it. So we're gonna need a hand grinder for this. And we already talked about this during the equipment part. Uh, we're definitely gonna need a shroud like this because if we don't do that, it, it, this dust is just gonna be everywhere. It's not gonna work. I got my cup wheel set up, ready to go. And I just wanted to point out how this actual shroud works. This is the one from Dustless Technologies. This is their XP shroud. And I like this because this little door here, obviously even this here, I won't be able to get all the way to the wall. So I'm gonna have to slide this door open uh, and that will explode my, my actual wheel there. So now I can get all the way up there. And I like this door because it just slides on and off. There's nothing to actually take apart there. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind is when you're running this, obviously, you know, if I'm out here with it, it's not gonna catch any dust at all. And, you know, it's just gonna go everywhere. So if I need to hit a little spot out here, I'm just gonna make sure that thing's closed. And when I need to run it along my wall, I'm gonna open it up. The, the thing is, you know, as I'm doing this, the dust is going to want to go this direction. And so I like to try to kind of hold it at about like that kind of an angle. And that just helps minimize that dust all over the place. If I was to hold it like this, I'd be losing a lot more. So with all that being said, all we need to do is hit these edges and we're ready to go. Well, we pretty much got everything prepped and uh, all our quick fix is all ground down. Uh, everything is completely good to go for prep at this point. Um, now, before we actually apply any epoxy, we're just gonna need to make sure we completely, thoroughly clean this floor and just give it that one final clean uh, before we put any epoxy down. We really don't want any of that dust residue just sitting on that floor. And so to start this off, we just really need to thoroughly vacuum every square inch of the floor and even both, uh, two different directions is a good idea. Um, you know, we always give it a final step, uh, whether that might be an acetone wipe down or maybe that's some, some sort of a dust mop. But if we don't thoroughly extract all the dust as much as we can with that vacuum first, all we're going to end up doing is, is just pushing it around. The beauty of, of this whole system that we're going to be doing down here is you guys can see, you know, after, now that we've got everything ground down and you can see all the repairs that we've had to make to this floor. And, you know, along the one wall over there, you can see, you know, there was concrete that was actually um, busted out and a drainage pipe put in. And right now, it, it, you know, it's not looking very good. Um, you know, you can just see all these repairs that, that just really stick out. And the great thing about this chip system is when we're said and done, um, we won't see any of that anymore. And it'll all look like, like one surface. There's also a lot of ups and downs in this floor. And we're not going to take all those out, but we're just going to notice them a lot less um, once, those, once those chips get on. So this is the last time that we're going to see um, all these repairs in this floor. So uh, I just want to run over the application tools real quick here as far as what we're going to actually need uh, to apply this stuff before we get on to mixing. And, and one of the first things, just as always, is, is some sort of gloves. You know, this stuff is really sticky and you get it all over your hands. It can just really be hard to get off. So it's always a good idea to wear some, some gloves. Uh, we're going to have to be walking in the epoxy pretty much the entire time. So um, some pair of spike shoes. I really love these ones here from Shoe In, but, you know, any kind of actual spike shoes, even if it's a Buckwan style, um, that'll work just fine. As far as spreading the epoxy around. Uh, these squeegees here from Midwest Rake just work awesome for that. They've got quite a few different uh, mill options as far as how thick we'll put it down. For this system, we like this um, eight to 12 mil. I also love these, they make them in two different sizes. Uh, so, you know, uh, we can have a larger one for a job like this. If you need to get around back, you know, uh, behind some stuff, these small ones are good. I also love these squeegees because they're also color coded and you know, the different mill sizes, um, there's a green, there's a yellow, there's a blue. And so it's just a good visual just to know that you've got the right squeegee for the job. Obviously some sort of a handle uh, to put that stuff on is always required. And then we are gonna need to back roll this epoxy before we um, actually cast chips into it. So I like this um, micro plush, 5 16th micro plush from Worcester Brush. And so we're gonna be using these both in 18 and then we have a nine for our edges. Obviously, um, we're gonna need a different roller frame for the 18s. Uh, so this guy here is made that it'll accept those, those larger rollers, um, normal nine inch roller. And then just a couple, um, just cheap chip brushes just to get along the edges. We don't need anything expensive. You know, the epoxy is gonna level out, but we just need something that we can get up along the walls. And then the last thing is just a simple three gallon bucket. These work really nice uh, for casting our chips. Um, you know, trying to put those in a five gallon bucket is just, they, they get a little bit heavy and they're hard to get to the bottom. So I just like these nice three gallon uh, buckets here to fill up. And other than that, I think we're ready to get to mixing.
All right, so we are ready to start mixing our epoxy and I just wanted to talk, um, just run over the mixing process real quick. And the first thing is the actual tool itself. And this is a, a problem that we see, um, you know, mistakes that people make is, uh, you know, we got a three gallon kit of epoxy here. We're gonna mix the entire kit. And we see people uh, making the mistake of using a small little mixture like this that's really only made for one gallon, and it's just not big enough. I don't care what kind of drill you have, there's just not enough volume here to actually spin a three gallon uh, kit. So we're gonna be using one of these. This is actually made for five gallons, uh, but that's gonna work great for this three gallon kit of epoxy. The other thing is that I really prefer to actually use a corded drill uh, when we're mixing this stuff. Now, um, don't get me wrong, it, a cordless drill will spin this stuff. It's not that, uh, it's not a power issue. It's just that we're gonna mix this for an entire three minutes. And, you know, let's say we were mixing five kits of this, people don't realize how fast that burns your batteries out. And I've just seen it happen too many times on job sites. Uh, guys using cordless tools, uh, they don't have enough batteries and they end up hand mixing this by the end. And that is just not a good idea. So just something, um, this is a hammer drill, but anything you got just with a cord on it, um, that's all we need. As far as the process goes, um, the, here's the, the beauty of this system is that we're making this whole kit and we don't need any additional containers at this point. Um, all we're gonna do is, is we have our tent pack. We're just gonna open this up. We're gonna dump it right into our bucket of A, uh, give that a mix just to get things going. And then we're gonna open up our B and mix the entire thing right in this factory pail. And, and again, the beauty is we don't need to measure anything. We don't need any additional buckets or anything like that. Now, if you get to the end of the floor and you guys just need to make a half a kit, well, um, then you will need to actually get some measure containers and it's fine. Just always remember, two parts A uh, to one part B, and then you can make any amount uh, that you want after that. And that's why it's always a good idea to add all the pigment to the A first, and that way that's all in there and our color will be the same no matter how much uh, that we're making up. Now, uh, this here particular floor um, is about 600 square feet. And you know, we normally with, with the squeegee we're using, we're gonna get somewhere in that 150 square foot range out of this epoxy. Now, I also know that this floor, uh, just having a lot of ups and downs, it, it, we're not gonna get as good of coverage. This floor is nice and flat, you know, we can figure that a lot closer. So, you know, we're figuring on probably using all six gallons of this, even though um, that's gonna get us down to more like the 100 square foot range. And so uh, the, the process is gonna be, after I dump that B in, um, I'm gonna stick my mixer down in there and I'm gonna you know, go ahead and spin it. Um, I don't wanna go full speed, but I do wanna create a little bit of a vortex. Uh, mixing it too slow can actually uh, lead to soft spots. And my process has always been, again, it's gonna be a total of three minutes, but my process has always been to go for a minute and a half with the drill, and then I'm gonna take my paint stick and I'm gonna scrape all the edges, um, especially down in the corner um, where the whole vertical and horizontal transition is, just to make sure none of that A gets stuck on the sides of the pail, um, and I don't have to worry about any soft spots for that. So um, after I've done that, then I'll go ahead and do an additional minute and a half. So total of three minutes, stopping halfway in between to scrape with the paint stick. So I'm gonna start out by dumping this epoxy right on the floor and then I can spread it around with my squeegee. Now the best thing to do is to dump out the entire kit. This epoxy has a pot life of about 20 to 30 minutes. So if I leave some in the bucket too long, it'll start setting up on me and it might even start smoking and become unusable. Once I get it all out of the bucket and onto the floor, I'll have plenty of time to work with it. After I have it all spread out, all I need to do is back roll everything to even it all out. I like to give the epoxy about 15 minutes or so to level out before I start throwing the chips, which is perfect for an area this size because it's not going to take me much longer than that than to put this whole area down. It's always good to fill up a few buckets with chips ahead of time so it's ready to go and as soon as I'm done back rolling, I can go straight to chipping. If you're working on a larger area, you may need to get somebody chipping before this epoxy is even all out on the floor. There are a few different methods of throwing the chips and there's really no right or wrong here, but the important thing is that you get them up in the air so they can fall down like snow and I would avoid throwing in a downward motion. You might notice some bare spots along the walls and have to sprinkle in the edges. Now what I'm looking for here is a nice thick coat of these chips and if I was gonna just try to cast them randomly or not throw enough on, there's a good chance that I would end up with a lot of inconsistencies in the final product. The idea is to cast the chips until you can't even see the epoxy anymore. Now as I get about half of this floor broadcasted, I can look back over it and if I see any shiny spots, well I just need to go back up and recast those areas. 
Well, that's pretty much it uh, for today. We got all our epoxy down, all our chips are done, and now we just need to let this stuff dry uh, to the point where we can actually scrape it and do our top coat. Uh, so with this particular epoxy, uh, that's usually between eight to 14 hours, just depending on temperature. Uh, it's nice and warm down here. So um, we're just gonna go ahead and show up in the morning and everything is gonna be ready to go. So we will see you guys then and we'll get to the last stage of the project. All right, so we're back here the next morning and our epoxy is all set up and ready to go, uh, ready to get to the next step. And so, you know, when we first, when you first get there the next morning, the best thing to do is just go to wherever you um, ended up at. And, you know, the thing about this chip system is, you know, you really aren't gonna be able to feel the coating under all these excess chips. You know, yesterday we really chipped this heavy to make sure we get good coverage. Uh, so it, it's hard to know if, if I'm pushing the limits and I'm just trying to hit just the time when it's just ready. Best thing to do, go to your last spot and just take your hands and just brush off some excess chips just like that. And again, I know this is already ready, um, you know, because it, it's been quite a few hours. But then I just take my thumb and I'm going to push down on those chips and I'm going to put quite a bit of pressure on that and I'm going to try to twist my thumb. And again, right there, I can feel that's nice and solid. There's no chips twisting um, under my thumb. So um, if they are twisting and you can still feel them moving uh, down there, then it's just not quite ready yet. And you're just going to have to wait um, a couple more hours. Uh, now that this is all good to go, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to grab a floor scraper and we're going to start scraping these excess chips because again, we, we chipped it really heavy and now we need to get these uh, really honed down nice so we can get a nice um, top coat on here. And so to do this, what I really like is not actually a real floor scraper. It's actually a topping smoother. And then once we get that done and, and, and we're done shave, scraping and shaving, well, now all we're going to do is we're just going to take a vacuum and we're going to thoroughly vacuum everything back up, um, you know, try to get all those loose chips, um, you know, back up before we start top coating. And, you know, we're not going to get 100% of those chips completely, um, you know, cleaned up. But when I run my hand across it, you know, I really don't want to see anything, you know, bouncing back at me or anything. And so you can see that, that this is good to go. All right, we are almost done here. We got all our chips scraped down. Everything is looking really really good and now all we need to do is just put on our top coat and this thing is done and good to go so to go over a few things that we're going to need today uh, the product we're going to be using for this top coat is going to be rock hard urethane and you know i love it for this kind of situation for a few different reasons first of all it's incredibly low odor again we're in this homeowner's basement and the last thing we want to do is stink them out of the house and so this stuff is incredibly low odor in fact it's almost zero odor although it's still incredibly tough and durable um, from abrasion and for chemical resistance. I also love it for a couple other reasons. The first one is it doesn't require any mixing, which you can see we don't have any mixing material out here. Uh, this is a moisture cured um, single component urethane, and so we can dump it right out of the jug and start spreading it and back rolling it. Um, I also love it for a floor like this because it just really lays out really nice and we don't have to fight roller marks. Again, this floor has got a lot of ups and downs, and if we were using something really fast setting, it'd just be hard to get it to look right. So just a great, great uh, product for this top coat we're gonna be doing. As far as some tools we're gonna need, uh, we're still gonna need our spike shoes. Again, just like yesterday, we're gonna have to be walking in the, the at least the guy back is gonna have to be walking in the urethane, so we're gonna need those. A um, little bit different squeegee today. Uh, this is still a speed squeegee from Midwest Rake, although this one is their flat flexible, and I just love this one because, um, you know, again, we don't want to use a notch squeegee now because the, the whole idea of this is we really want to scrape it as hard as we can over top of those chips. And it's almost like we're scraping the highs off and letting it settle in the lows. And then when we back roll it, it'll just redistribute it and we're gonna end up with the perfect top coat. And this guy here just works awesome. Um, I like the flex that it has to it. It's available in two different sizes. You know, if you guys have a, a magic trial and you're really comfortable with those, that would work uh, for this step too. I just like this one because we can push it and pull it. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and um, use the same gloves, uh, same rollers as yesterday, a few chip brushes for the edges, handle for our rollers, and that's pretty much it. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. The first thing I like to do once I have some on the floor is work in the edges and get the roller thoroughly saturated so it doesn't pull off too much urethane on that first pass of the back roll. After that, I can start pulling it with a flat squeegee and a second person can start rolling. Now I like to pull this urethane out as tight as possible over the chip so I don't end up with too much top coat. We'll have plenty of time to work with rock hard urethane. We can roll it both directions and it just does a great job of leveling out after the roller. 
Well guys, that's pretty much it for today's project. The top coat is all cured out and this floor is now ready to use. If you guys have any questions or suggestions, please leave them in the comments right below. And for a schedule of our in-depth live training classes, please visit deco-cretesupply.com and click on the training page. If you guys found this video helpful, please let us know by hitting the like and subscribe buttons, share it on social media, and don't forget about that bell icon so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos and it really helps our channel out. So from all of us here at DecoCrete TV, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.